Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Uh, if you've been with us before and you're suddenly hearing some music and thinking, what the hell? You're nothing to be alarmed at. This is Leonard Cohen, Dr. Wenzel. Made a special request. This is I'm Your Man by the uh, late Leonard Cohen. It's going to let this play while everybody's entering the room. Just going to yak at you for a minute or two. I see a lot of folks coming in just now. While we are entering the room, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you all to, to join me if you take your finger or cursor, whatever you're using to manipulate your computer, just go down to the bottom and hover. And what you'll see is a little thought bubble. It says the word chat underneath it. Click that open if you would. Uh, and then make sure that it's oriented so it says all panelists and attendees, so that you're talking to everybody. It says we are a community and the aim here is to make sure we're all chit-chatting with one another over the course of this hour. So you can ask each other questions, share some information and all of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in here and just say, hi, it's Sean and send that out to all of you. If you would, go ahead, you do the same thing. Just add your name, the organization that you're with, if you don't mind too terribly, and then where you're coming in from. Hey, Carly, hey, Trishna, how are you, my friend? Uh, boy, you guys are going fast. Okay, hey, Paul, Lynn, Betsy, how are you? Actually, Dr. Wenzel, that's your sister, Betsy. Abby, uh, Ariel, Carrie, John, or McAllister, Nancy, Ryan, Sarah, Jessica, Samantha, Lisa. Okay, y'all are starting to go too fast, as you always do, so. If you would, take a look and see who else is in here. Make sure you're saying hello and checking in with one another. Chances are there's an acquaintance or a good friend or a former colleague in the mix here. Dwayne, how are you? Louise, uh, Beth, how are you? Uh, Susan, how are you? Annie, a lot of NYC folks there. So go ahead and say hi to Annie if you would. Uh, Shaheen, how are you? Did you get married, Shaheen? I got to know. So our friend Shaheen was planning a wedding. I hope I'm not giving up the ghost there. So I was planning a wedding not too long ago. I hope that ended up coming off for you. Hey, Doug from Pittsburgh. How are you, my friend? It's a former network board member, Doug Root, one of my favorite human beings. Uh, Hilda, Julia, how are you? Josh, nice to see you. Uh, in San Francisco, Annie also. Oh, hey, Carly. Yeah, so Annie and Carly, y'all are together in New York. Okay. So while y'all are continuing to chit chat, a couple things I just want to tell you in case you've not been with us before. Our colleague, Clary, speak today. Our colleague, Carrie Klein, is going to be taking live notes. We'll share those out after this is over. And in the meantime, she will be throwing links into the chat while we're underway here. So if you're looking for a link or something, chances are you'll be able to find it here in the chat. And then as we go a little further along towards the end, Dr. Wenzel will be taking your questions. And so you can put your questions again. If you take your cursor, just go down there where you've been answering, uh, saying hello to everybody. Just right next to that, you'll see a little kind of two thought bubble says Q and A. Pretty evident what that is. That's the place where we're going to go and take questions. And you can vote for each other's questions. So we make sure we get to the, the questions that are most relevant, most salient to all of you. Macy, how are you? Pamela, Pamela, how are you, my friend? Uh, with that, Tristan Mahabir is running the deck, so I'm going to ask him to advance the slide in a quick minute. And also, uh, other thing I should flag for you is Yab Sarah Ferris, our colleague uh, from the network team, is monitoring all of this and making notes on social media. Specifically, she's on Twitter with the hashtag ComNetLive. That's C O M N E T L I V E. If you go there, you can see the notes that she's made. And after all this, she'll do like one of those Twitter highlight things, so you can catch up with those notes there as well and of course the other thing is you should know we're making a recording of all this as we always do so we'll post that up on the network's website and on youtube in short order all right mr t if you would go ahead and take us along uh, a couple things to flag for you before we get to dr wenzel first one is this uh we have been working with the team at IDEO, the wonderful global design firm based out of the bay area and they've done a very kind and generous thing and that is this they have said that if you are a Community Foundation, let's say a foundation. Community Foundation or nonprofit is trying to help get the word out about COVID-19 by amplifying, sending along the messages from the CDC, the NIH, or your local health department if that's appropriate. Uh, the folks at IDEO want to help you do that a little bit more effectively. We know how important design and, and visual information and information design is. And so they're offering up their help free of charge to anyone who needs it. You can go to this, the link that I'm sure Carrie's going to put in if she hasn't already uh, to share with us how you can find uh, out to get more information. Sorry, I'm trying to turn off the computer. Uh, Tristan, if you go to the next slide. So the other thing I want to flag for you. So in addition to these gatherings, we're very grateful to Dr. Wenzel for coming back and being with us for a third time. He's going to come back again in a couple of weeks. We've also been hosting Calm Network local groups. I think they're in about 18 cities now around the country. So if you're in places like Portland or San Francisco, New York, uh, Austin, Chicago, Boston, uh, Detroit, Denver, uh, these local groups are gathering so you can actually get together with folks. Kind of to your question, Carly, are there people or Annie, are there people in your city? Yeah, 
Com Network New York is a great place to go to connect with other people who live in your area code or your zip code uh, and build community. That's been the aim for the last couple of years we've been doing these and they've obviously moved virtually uh, online uh, in the last couple of weeks and will be for the foreseeable future, just mindful of some of the dangers we're facing. All right, Mr. T, if you would take us forward. You can get information, by the way, on Com Network Local at comnetwork.org and find out how to get in touch with uh, with folks in your, uh, oh, Carrie already put the link in, so I'll stop right there. Other thing I want to flag for you, uh, Doug Hadaway and our good friends, Carrie Schum and Eric Zimmerman from Hadaway Communications read through the entire CDC crisis communications manual and pulled out some of the things we can all be doing to promote productive actions right now. So you can find that at comnetwork.org, but this is in a nutshell what they found. These are the big things that are going to be science and sort of data-based advice to help you help people stay safe and ensure that all of our frontline health workers are also having the opportunity to do the best they can without getting overwhelmed. Mr. T, if you will take it forward. Last bit, it's not been off and I've gotten to share really happy, beautiful, good news, but can you take a look at this gorgeous little baby? She showed up on earth, as you can see on the 12th, so just a couple days ago, but this is, and it's a baby girl, Jasper Elliott Teague Smalls, I might get in trouble for, for out and mom, but Jade Floyd, who was the vice chair of the communications network board, uh, board and her husband, Charles, welcomed Jasper uh, into the world just a couple days ago. I think mom and baby both doing really, really well and Oh my goodness, isn't that just the most beautiful baby? She's extraordinary and she's not mindful of all that's going on. Mom and baby are safe and well. And, and, and we know that Jasper's gonna get to the other side of this and we are all too. So with that, happy, beautiful news. Also shout out, happy birthday to Jesse Salazar, former network board chair, he's celebrating today. So if you know Jesse, shoot him a note, let's embarrass him. I think he's turning 27 again. I feel like he's reverse aging. Uh, if you would, Mr. T, why don't I go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Wenzel, who's going to bring us up to speed on what we've learned and what we know now. Um, remember, the world knew nothing about this virus six, seven months ago. It just didn't exist. Uh, so everything that we're learning is new. Every day is kind of a gift to learn a little bit more and try to get ahead of this thing. With that, Dr. Wenzel, thank you again just for making the time for us. You're incredibly kind and generous of you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks very much. So a title slide, what I want you to know is I have an uh, email address if people I uh, have a question that uh, wasn't addressed or they want to discuss something else. And I would also say that I, I may mention one or two uh, drugs, but I have no uh, financial conflict at all. I own uh, no stock in any uh, pharmaceutical company. Okay, we'll go to the next slide, please. So I want to begin uh, with uh, this picture of John Keats, who lived from 1795 to 1821. Uh, wonderful poet whose own, if you will, pandemic uh, caused his own death at age 25. Uh, he was a victim of tuberculosis, despite a prolific uh, career already in poetry. Um, and uh, some of you may know, though he lived in London, uh, he had moved to Rome, uh, where we're having a huge uh, problem, of course, with our current pandemic. And he stayed at a house only a couple of uh, yards from the Spanish steps. And what he said in one of his poems, that beauty is truth, truth beauty. That's all you need to know on earth and all you need to know. And in talking about truth, uh, I'm not engaged in metaphysics or politics, but the truth uh, related to the data from public health and uh, science. Next slide. So when we're reflecting uh, on a crisis, I think it's important for each of us to assess what do we really know, what we don't know, and very importantly, what assumptions drive our current thinking and our policy decisions. And often assumptions are hidden or put out of the way. We don't uh, bring them to the light often enough. So let me begin with what we know or think we have a pretty good idea about with the next slide. So this slide on the left, uh, some global data, and you can see uh, how the US compares to other countries. Uh, and uh, on the left is number of cases since the day of the hundredth case and the log scale on the vertical going from 100 all the way up to a million. And then uh, on the horizontal or X axis, you can see uh, the days going out again since the hundredth uh, case, which allows uh, some of the uh, le leveling out of the plane. So you can see, first of all, if you look up high to the right and uh, in the middle, China and South Korea 
they got out very early with robust systems uh, and they were able to flatten the curve very, very early. If you see in the middle uh, the trajectory of the UK, Spain and Italy, uh, it took a little while for them to get going and the slopes were higher than what you see for uh, South Korea and China, certainly. And US uh, now leading in terms of the total deaths. Uh, we got out a little bit late, but the good news is Spain and Italy and maybe the United States, it looks like there might be some flattening of the curve. Again, the point here is uh, social distancing worked and the earlier that it was employed and the robustness made a difference. On the right, you see, again, cumulative number, in this case, deaths, uh, by number of days since 100 deaths, and the deaths in thousands going up on the y-axis, and then left to right, the number of days. And you can see the United States in green, uh, again, a uh, high number of deaths were not leveling off that often followed by two or three weeks, the number of cases. And at the bottom, you can see those countries that uh, get out quickly, uh, certainly China at the bottom in the blue, and countries in between. So I think what we know is social distancing really does work. Next slide. And even if you look at our cumulative US deaths uh, and a couple of different states, and again, uh, the days since passing the 10th death are on the horizontal axis, uh, and then you can see the deaths uh, on the y-axis or a vertical axis. Um, and you can see towards the bottom of the slide, if you will, the state of Washington, very early, very robust, very uh, much milder curve, if you will, and beginning to flatten off. And similarly for California and the yellow kind of in the middle. In contrast, Louisiana and New York had a little bit later start and their slopes are higher. And uh, New York, fortunately, it looks like they're beginning to flatten off from everything that I've heard. It's hard to see on this kind of a large scale. So again, local data and international data, social distancing works. Next slide. Again, just the schematic that came out of the New York Times and suggesting that wearing a mask can protect you and others. If you need home, I really believe this, uh, wear a mask and be sure to keep your, your distance. And the mask, anytime you go out for the grocery, for the post office, where you're gonna be in public, protect yourself, uh, you may be a symptomatic carrier and protect yourself from someone else who may be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Next slide. Again, the simulation, which you can't see it pronounced, but is if you wait something like 15 or 20 minutes, someone who coughs can have large droplets that exceed the, if you will, six feet guideline to stay away in social distancing. And although most of the large droplets, those greater than 10 microns, that fall to the ground or evaporate about six feet. But dynamic studies looking at the spectrum of droplets coming out when someone coughs says even large droplets, those greater than 10 microns, can go more than 12 feet, sometimes out close to 20, as you can see here. And the second kind of droplets, the very tiny, less than 10 microns uh, aerosols, if you will. And I've described these as microscopic hot air balloons encasing a virus. They hang out in the air with the wind stream. And someone in a closed environment can cough. Two hours later, uh, someone else can enter the room after the first person left, breathe in these microscopic hot air balloons and become infected. So again, um, I think we have to be aware of the value of, of some kind of mask, at least uh, a mask for the large droplets for everybody. Next slide. So one of the problems that I bring up is uh, What's the real number of infected Americans? And I wanted to give you a, a graphic in the middle. Since we lack widespread testing, I would just point out that a 10% random sample of all people in Iceland recently showed that half, 50% of all the infected people had no symptoms. So I have on this graphic uh, two rectangles. They're equal size, the symptomatic, and the asymptomatic, same proportions. And then if I feel generous, I would say, we might be lucky if we're testing 50% or half of the symptomatic people 
who come to us. And the reasons are we haven't had enough testing, there haven't been the kits available, and also because of that, there's been some restrictions for testing, mostly geared to patients who are coming into the hospital where diagnosis is needed. So if you look at what we have here, basically we're only counting maybe one fourth of the total cases, half of the symptomatic and none of the asymptomatic. So it, to get the real multiplier, you would take whatever is reported in theory, multiply it by four. And if you think, for example, it'd be reasonable, maybe we're only testing a third of the symptomatic patients because of the supply problem, the multiplier would then be six. Next slide. So looking at doubling intervals in our own country, I have reported cases, and then in the middle reported deaths, and true cases, if I wanted to be conservative and say, I'm gonna take the reported number and multiply it by 3.75. So if you look at the 1st of April, we had reported in this country 200,000 cases and 2,000 deaths. And if I take the reported cases of 200,000, multiply it by 3.75, on the right, you'll see probably a true infections accounting 750,000 people. On April 4th, if you look in the middle column, we had doubled the doubling time in three days, 4,000 deaths. So very uh, tight doubling time, which isn't good. However, reported cases didn't double until April 8th, and that's at 400,000 on the reported cases, a seven-day cycle. Uh, and if that 400,000 reported, in my view, might be as many as 1.5 million true cases with a multiplier. So here we are, and one of the questions you might ask is, how many cycles do we have left before the 1st of May? And I'm thinking somewhere between one and two. Maybe probably run in the middle, one and a half. But if it's one to two, the reported cases that I'm saying we might see next time we meet would be 1.2 to 2.4 million reported. And reported deaths, if we have 30,000 now on 15 April, and we have one to two cycles, then you would expect the doubling to 60,000 with one cycle, or to 120,000 with two cycles. So I'm predicting that we'll have at least 60,000 deaths in the next two weeks total. And the real number of cases, uh, if you look at the reported number, the range and multiply that out, 4.5 to 9 million really true cases. And that's still a fraction of the total population. And I'll come back to that in terms of herd immunity. Remember, of all the cases, 5% get admitted to the hospital. Of those who are admitted, about a third go to a critical care unit. And we think that a 1% mortality is pretty accurate. Next slide. Go on to the next, please. So one of the questions I'd like to raise, we're assuming that the uh, R0, which is the um, case reproduction number, could be greater than five. Do we have one slide before this, uh, Tristan? Did I miss one or? Yeah, thanks. So on this slide, I wanted to talk about the case reproduction number, which is designated R0. It's the average number of secondary cases among susceptible, key point, among susceptible for each primary infection. So the higher the number, the more communicable. So I have examples of diseases, the key transmission mechanism, r not estimates, and I'll call the community immunity requirement in order to prevent spread. So we call that herd immunity. So for measles, one of the most communicable diseases we know is spread by the tiny droplets, the aerosol, that hang in the air for a couple of hours. R0 is 15, that means of all susceptibles exposed to a primary, there'll be 15 secondary cases, very communicable. And because it's so highly communicable, a very high herd immunity requirement of 95% means that we have to vaccinate almost every child or, and, and make sure that we follow up 95% have to be 
immune to prevent a little cluster. And we've seen clusters in societies in California, small groups in New York, where they haven't had that high number. Chickenpox, also communicable, and aerosol are R0 of 11 and less than 95% herd immunity requirement. And if you look down at COVID-19 at the bottom, it is currently thought to be large droplets. And the estimates are two to almost five for R0. And even at that level, I'm estimating we would need at least 70% of the population immune to prevent transmission. Immunity could come from natural infection or perhaps from an excellent vaccine for in maybe in the next nine to 12 months if we're lucky. So one of the questions I wanted to ask with this slide is in COVID-19, what would cause the R0 to be greater than five? Remember, as you go up to 15, you need higher herd immunity and you're more communicable and you're more likely to be an aerosol. What would cause R0 to be greater than five, which is the current estimate? Next slide. So it could be greater than five at the top bullet if we underestimate the proportion of transmissions by asymptomatic carrier who are infected, or if we underestimate proportion of transmission by aerosol. And I just saw a few days ago, the first model that takes into account the impact of asymptomatic carriers. The others didn't so far. And to surprise, the estimate could be very wide confidence limits. But if you look to the right, the point estimate in this study was 15.4 as communicable as measles. And what the authors who came from uh, such good institutions, University of Texas, uh, Harvard, uh, Boston University and others said that the major driver of pandemics, recognizing the asymptomatic carriers is that group that we don't know about. I put the author's name in there. Uh, this study is available through uh, this, uh, this uh, DOI organization number. And some, as you may know, that some authors have actually placed their articles um, in a holding capacity, if you will, a uh, uh, accessible for other scientists, even though they're now undergoing peer review. So I don't know if this 15.4 is gonna hold. We need replication, but it would explain if it's close why so many diligent healthcare workers who are getting infected despite doing everything right that they've been told, or why healthcare transmission from patient to physician or physician and healthcare worker back to patient is high, and how we got such a rapid spread globally, starting in China to other continents in a short time. Now, even if this model is um, moves the um, R naught to greater than five, it still doesn't rule out some aerosol transmission. And we have to keep our minds open about both. So this slide would emphasize the impact possibly of the asymptomatic carrier. Next slide. So if the R naught is greater than five, there'd be an urgent need, in my opinion, for cross-sectional study of entire hospital inpatient population and healthcare workers. I think patients need to know who their healthcare workers are, are they infected or not? And certainly the healthcare workers, extraordinarily exposed, have to know if patients who look like they have no problem, uh, such as on an orthopedic floor, may in fact be infected. A study that I've been looking to see is air samples in hospitals particularly, and uh, frequent surface samples in hospitals that are frequently touched, like bed rails on a patient, for example. And if the R0 is greater than five, a highly effective vaccine will have to create an immunity in over 70% of the population to be optimally effective. And that's something we have to keep an eye on. Well, curiously, only three or four hours ago, I saw this uh, preprint of an article from Emerging Infectious Disease that'll be out in July. And what Chinese uh, investigators did is actually screened the air and 
culture many surfaces in hospitals in both ICUs and general wards. And the surprise was that they found widely distributed uh, markers of infection, that is the RNA, 35% of some of the air samples in ICUs, 35%, 43% of patient handrails. And when they cultured various uh, computer mouse, 75% of those samples were positive. So this, if it's confirmed, would say the virus is everywhere. It's on surfaces in the hospital and it's in the air. And that might mean that R naught is greater than five. Next slide. So to switch to the drugs and just understand what we're trying to do with clinical trials, despite enthusiasm for individual drugs targeting, targeting COVID-19 by various groups, no one drug is known to work. That's a fact. Detailed adverse effects in the population, larger populations are unknown. So sometimes when you get large groups together and you find out 5% of the people had significant adverse effects, you need clinical trials and large ones. And clinical trials, we're back to truth, are the bedrock of truth in science, looking for a new drug or a vaccine. So the way that works, if you look to the left, the pool of potential patients for study, uh, the investigators would want to narrow the entry requirements so they could say for this group that we're studying, for example, patients 18 to 60, men and women, uh, no terminal disease that could affect their life in the next month, those kind of criteria. Then once you have that pool, the patients are then randomized to avoid any bias in assignment to either the new therapy or the control examine prospectively forward for outcomes and the people who are evaluating them prospectively are not aware they're masked evaluators not aware of which patient got the new drug versus the control the clinical trials at the bottom use statistics to estimate the probability of a chance finding and they may do models to correct for the effect of the drug versus the effects of extraneous factors, such as AIDS, their comorbidities, and, and other issues. They are the bedrock, that is the clinical trial for truth. Next slide. So right now, uh, we have a number of drugs being evaluated in clinical trials. I'll just review the categories. Remind you that 80% of COVID-19 patients have mild illness, fortunately. 15% have moderate illness, might be admitted to an ICU for oxygen. And the severe would be 5% of all patients maybe requiring uh, a ventilator. So we have antivirals and the drug hydroxychloroquine. And these are being given primarily in the early stages so far. And then what we know as you get to severe illness, the body is having this huge outpouring of inflammatory responses, which actually can cause multi-organ failure, just like sepsis. And there are now drugs that are targeting the immune system to dampen that immune response, keep people alive. What I point out is that recently, the Chinese have been reporting up to a third of their patients with central nervous system signs or symptoms. This could be anything from hallucination to uh, altered mental status, and cerebrovascular problems. For example, if the virus is in, attacks one of the small capillaries in the brain, there could be actually small uh, bleeds, a uh, stroke, essentially. And so we need to explore therapy for this part, the nervous system response, as well as the cardiac and pulmonary system. And then nobody has really spent a lot of time talking about post-discharge. But as you listen to patients who recover, many of them have been on both uh, NPR and national TV. Some of them say, I'm glad to be home, but if I walk across the hall, I'm short of breath. So something we shouldn't dismiss is the long-term symptom may be indicating a persistent problem with the lungs or the heart or somewhere else, and what might help their recovery. So I'm suggesting we need some work in this area. Next slide. 
the future is certainly un uncertain. And if you said the question, what about returning to pre-COVID lifestyle? That's not gonna happen in 2020. And what we hope to do is do our best to get to 2021 with an effective vaccine and then get enough herd immunity to end this. Are we getting to the peak of the epidemic curve? I think so. Some people are saying, well, it's gonna happen this month. I've been a little more conservative saying maybe mid-May, but as late as mid-June. We may have a flattening without necessarily a sharp peak. Certainly the downslope is uncertain in duration and rate. And again, emphasize, we don't have valid numbers of infection. What about relaxing social distancing? Again, we need more numbers. I'll come back to that in another slide. But I think we have, we watched China and Singapore who began to relax uh, in the last month and we'll see what happened. They had some bursts uh, in numbers and they had to then uh, reverse their program. And people in Europe now, different countries are talking about relaxing different parts of the uh, process over there. What I hope is citizens, I'm worried that they'll begin to fatigue and feel the pressure of business and politics before we're ready medically. We may consider, somebody may consider relaxation of lower risk people. Children who are healthy, uh, maybe don't have asthma and heart disease, healthy teens, and certainly antibody positive children and adults. And we will have to have widespread testing to know how well we're doing. Next slide. So how might relaxation of lockdown begin? Right now, um, we have food stores that are open. We have pharmacies available, uh, gas stations, first responders, um, and we're doing well so far with our social distancing. What I could imagine sooner, and I didn't put a date to say sooner and later, but sooner the retail stores I think could open. With department stores, sporting goods, bookstores, crafts, furniture, jewelry, leather, you can think of others. But even as we do this, I think we should go very slowly and say, we still wear a mask, that is the people going to these retail places and the people servicing and keep social distancing within the store. What will happen much later, I think, and I don't know how many months, and we'll need again the testing, entertainment with concerts, theaters, clubs, athletics uh, and fitness centers, close contact, probably even later hair, nail salons. Uh, we may have different views of how we'll have a concert uh, all continue virtually or theaters. We maybe could get creative with social distancing in the theater, but I think we have to be prepared to really follow up uh, carefully. Next slide. So I close with this slide. This is a photograph of Isaac uh, Asimov, who lived from 1920 to 1992. And he died uh, just as, uh, John Keats, the poet, died um, in, with his so, pandemic of that era. And he was uh, undergoing uh, open heart surgery, required some blood, unfortunately had contaminated blood with HIV, and he died uh, of the pandemic of that era of complications due to HIV. And I talked about what we know and don't know and assumptions, and one of the quotes I thought was apt he said, your assumptions are just windows on the world. Scrub them off once in a while or the light won't come in. And so what I'd like you to reflect on is what we know, what we don't know, what our current assumptions are. Thank you very much. I'd be delighted to try to answer your questions. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Wenzel. So we have a number of questions. We're gonna to try to get to them all. I'm gonna take the privilege of asking the first one. And so I'm gonna be the rube in the room. And I'm just gonna ask you, we talked about this a couple sessions ago, but maybe you could just do a quick primer for everybody to catch them back up. What is a virus? So we're talking about this, but I don't, I'm not sure all of us necessarily have a good command of like, what is a virus and how does it affect Well, a virus is a microbe. You could think of it as a genetic material surrounded in protein that live inside cells and take over the uh, machinery of the cells in order to make more of itself and thrive. Um, so in general, it doesn't live outside of cells, but it can persist for 
hours or occasionally days on the surface with enough uh, material around it so it can survive. So it's not thriving uh, out there. It really wants to be in a cell. And the really intelligent virus, if you want to think of it that way, would be one that invade us and doesn't cause us too much harm. So it can have a home for a long time. The very aggressive viruses that kill us uh, run out of luck because when we go, so do they. Gotcha. Okay, so we're going to go to questions now. First one comes from our friend Derek, who asks, there's conflicting information about whether those who have recovered from COVID-19 are immune to being reinfected. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great timely question. Um, in general, um, and even with uh, co coronaviruses, you, you tend to have, at least for a couple of years, uh, protection, a surrogate marker would be antibody positive titers. What we're finding is some reports that need to be confirmed of people who had negative tests in the hospital, they got discharged, and then they had symptoms and came back and had a positive test. And they maybe were somehow reinfected, that's one thought. The other possibility is that their negative test was a false negative in the hospital, and that their symptoms are really the persistent symptoms from the first hospital stay. And I don't think we know that for sure, but they are clearly a minority of patients. And if they are true reinfections or not, their illnesses tend to be milder than when they came in the first time. Okay, next question comes from our friend Abby who asks, uh, what areas do you think are really underfunded right now in the middle of this crisis? So for lots of the folks on this call, they're, they're the do-gooders of the world. They're coming from foundations and nonprofits. Where could, could folks most effectively put dollars to be most helpful right now? Well, the most, um, let's say, rampant areas for infection we're beginning to see in the last week or two. Uh, if you're looking at nursing homes uh, where the viruses run amok, if you're looking at prisons, uh, and also looking at uh, shelters for homeless people. Um, we have very little resources for those people. Uh, they need separation. How to do that is a real challenge. Uh, and that's one area that people could think about. CDC had its budget cut in the last couple of years. Um, and although they had certainly um, problematic issues related to the rollout of the uh, testing materials, uh, they've got a long history of uh, doing good things um, and uh, a lot of talent there. And uh, I think when we start thinking about robust response to the next pandemic, we need to make sure that uh, they have the resources needed to help us. So those are two areas that I would think of. Maybe the, the questioner has others that uh, he or she's thinking about, Abby is her. Okay, Lishka, uh, our friend, has seized on the same thing that I saw when I saw this deck earlier, which was, if we aren't going, quote unquote, back to normal until 2021, does that mean working from home and no travel for the rest of the year? Uh, I don't know for sure the answer to that. Uh, I, I think it will depend on once we have widespread testing, both for infection and widespread testing for the prevalence of antibodies, how many people uh, are we, do we have uh, in our population? What uh, herd immunity are we approaching? Uh, we'll be in better shape to answer those questions. Depends what happens in terms of travel to other countries as well. So if you look at South America, where it really hasn't taken off yet, um, as they enter their winter during our summer, uh, this may be an explosive situation down there with some of those countries having very few resources to manage it as well. You could say the same for Africa uh, as well. So that may change what, what happens with flights coming in as well as our travel there. I think we'll certainly have a, a while, and I think what we should do is slowly um, transition in phases to uh, a less uh, severe, if you will, uh, sort of isolation and uh, uh, social isolation. So let me put this to you in another way. I'm going to put you on the spot. If you sure. own a professional football team, notwithstanding all the other challenges that might go with that, including all the long-term brain injuries, are you feeling optimistic about football season this year? 
Uh, I'm a little pessimistic with what we have right now, in part because, again, uh, this is a, um, not just a, a sport where people are close together. We're close together in contact. We're shoulder to shoulder. Um, you could um, argue some of that there outside and so forth for most of the game. I would be pessimistic uh, at this point. It might change my mind uh, in two months, but uh, right now I wouldn't be an optimist. Our friend Carly asks, if someone thinks that they've already had COVID-19 and would want to get tested for antibodies, is that possible and even helpful? Uh, and then she, she continues, if someone has already had it and it was a mild case, and is it now okay they could be used for testing and even helping other vulnerable people? A lot of questions in there. Uh, I think it'd be very valuable to know who's immune. And I think uh, the people in immune, who are immune can certainly go back to their profession, no matter where that is. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd love to see uh, a whole bunch of people with very mild illness to recover quickly, have antibodies, and then um, they could all do something uh, very useful together that they couldn't do without that knowledge. Um, Hopefully, um, we'll, we'll have those tests available. There's some are available now, but most of the, the tests we have available looks for infection, not for antibodies. And I'm hoping that'll change drastically in the next month, maybe in the next two weeks. We need these uh, tests very much. Okay, next question comes from our friend Enrique who asks, uh, can you provide an update on vaccine development? Do you have any insights to share there? Are there any promising developments that we've seen? I think all of us, and this is worth remembering, we, we've been at this for about a month, gang. And so it's really easy to, I live with a six-year-old and nine-year-old who I love beyond comparison. And yet I would be perfectly happy to have a day or two away back in the office with them back at school. I get it. But the truth is, is we're still very much in the early stages of this. But that said, uh, is there anything we're hearing about vaccines that make you optimistic and maybe a timeline? I know you said 12 months from now, maybe at the earliest. Yeah, I, I mean, remember, I mean, I've done a number of clinical trials, uh, uh, including some vaccines. And remember what you do, you get the group together that could be vaccinated, a cohort. And if they fit the criteria, then you randomize them into two groups. And you look prospectively at side effects, hopefully in a mass way, blinded, so nobody knows who got vaccine, so you can't bias that from who got placebo vaccine. And the earliest time you probably would look for antibodies would be out two to four weeks. And you'd, be, you'd like to know something about persistence of antibodies, at least out to six uh, months. Um, so at this point, uh, I've not heard of anybody uh, talking about uh, uh, a, the antibody response in people with any vaccine. And I wouldn't be surprised just because it's so early. We might see uh, early uh, antibody responses in, in about a month from now, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and uh, we'll have to then wait at least that long. Okay, next question comes from our friend Katie. This is, I think, the question on everybody's mind. As I said, when I saw the deck, this was the thing I jumped to as well, which is, she said, so it seems based off of all the information that you've just shared with us, we probably won't be able to have events without a vaccine in place. And then the next question, what about those folks who will not or do not vaccinate the, the anti-vaxxers that are out there now? Well, I... Uh you know, the anti-vaxxers, uh, unfortunately, I mean, if there are really robust data about the efficacy of the vaccine, uh, will become victims, uh, just as many have in uh, certain societies. I was reading about the ultra-Orthodox groups in Israel, as well as the United States, victims of uh, measles, for example. Um, and um, a lot of people misled about the side effects of the measles vaccine. Uh, that really is a safe vaccine, um, saved numbers of lives and disability. So I feel sorry for the anti-vaxxers. Uh, they have sometimes an impact on isolated communities. Um, and unfortunately, their children are at risk and the kids don't have a vote. Um, we really need a vaccine to get back to, let's say, pre-COVID-19 era. So I would see, you know, if there's hope for that, yeah, there is, um, but I don't think we're going to see it till 
uh, late spring, maybe, of 2021. I was going to repeat that. Late spring of 2021. So if you're planning something and the timeline is October or August or January of next year, uh, you, you need to be pursuing other paths would be your best judgment. Yeah, I think other paths or watch the numbers very closely. And uh, if you're looking at uh, other paths, meaning travel, uh, very careful about where you're going, what's happening uh, at the place where your first stop is and final destination, uh, as well as uh, what's happening in the United States. Okay, our friend Karen, who works with the Harlem Children's Zone, they do some incredible work and, and incredibly grateful for all they're doing to help the kids up there stay healthy and fed, which I know is incredibly important. She says, beyond staying home, wearing our masks, and staying at least six feet apart, what's the most critical thing we can or should be doing to change the trajectory of the spread of COVID-19? Particularly, and this has been really, there's a lot of data out there now, this is happening in New York City, there's been a tremendous amount of spread among communities of color. Uh, where there's a, as she notes, a disproportionate spread rate of infection? Well, that's a very timely question. And I think uh, there are disenfranchised people uh, and people of color certainly lead the list. Um, illegal immigrants uh, who really do an awful lot to help our businesses in crowded conditions. So the crowding, um, often their older populations, who have, or younger population, maybe with multiple comorbidities. Um, they don't have access to preventive medicine. So their diet is not good. They're more obese, they're more diabetic. Uh, and then comes with that uh, heart disease. And uh, again, the very crowded living space for who people are uh, aliens who haven't registered uh, and they're frightened that something will happen, they'll get leave the country and they also don't have access to care so all of that adds up if you're someone earlier asked where could you put uh, uh, some some money uh, some resources um, that's true um, and i think what we should take from this pandemic is say somehow we have to uh, have rigorous attention to those disenfranchised groups ahead of time which will save us downstream, not just from a new uh, pandemic, but maybe other chronic, infect, chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes, uh, and try to do that prospectively, get them out of the disenfranchised label, if you will, do something positive ahead of time. Uh, our colleague Anna asks, uh, what are some predictions looking like for another wave of infections in the fall, similar to what happened with the Spanish flu back in 1918? Well, one of the problems is that uh, even if we're, we've infected a couple million people, that's uh, not even close to getting something uh, like a robust herd immunity. So we have a huge proportion of susceptible people. If it turns out that uh, the environment uh, in hospitals is really important and the environment in uh, particularly the air in closed uh, uh, places, uh, whether it's in the hospital or a closed building be, is more important. Um, that may change even how we uh, fight this. We may not just say any mask is available. We may be pointing more towards uh, uh, the N95 mask, particularly in the hospital. So that change could go on as well. Um, I forgot what else you were asking with that. Uh, well, let's go. Let, we have a number of questions, and I, I dismissed that one, so I might be able to dig it back up. Hang on a quick second. That was from... I'm not finding it, but we have a number of uh, others. I'm going to jump back to sure. it. If you, if you still have that question, just throw it back in the q and I promise we'll get to it. Uh, Lishka asks, is there any science out there that tells us what helps the human body be resilient against the virus? So I'm reminded like Chris Cuomo's wife was tossing all kinds of homeopathic stuff at him. Maybe it didn't do any harm, but does it do any good? Well, I mean, homeopathic uh, meds, I don't know whether they do good or not. I would just say, make sure they don't do any bad, no harm. Um, what I think is important is to... Um, Eat well and sleep well, which both of which are difficult uh, in our social isolation. 
Uh, I don't know many people who say they're sleeping through the night. Uh, and some people aren't eating well, they're closer to the kitchen or snacking. Uh, and I would say if you can, uh, do some exercise, even if it's taking a long walk, uh, isolating yourself from other people. So keeping as fit as you can, exercise has got a lot of pluses. Um, if you want to take this time to do intermittent fasting, which is shown to be very healthy, uh, and you're able to do that, start with the simple plan. Wait uh, between dinner and breakfast at least 12 to 14 hours. Uh, and do that periodically um, if you want to really try a new form. But I think, again, those basic things of keeping general health um, probably will help you. It, it will do no harm. You just made my wife, Dana, very, very happy. She's been on this kick where she stops eating, I think, at 7.30 or 8 and doesn't eat again until 11 the next morning. And it uh, means we don't get that glass of wine at the end of the evening or she doesn't join me. But uh, <laughs> but she'll be thrilled to know that she's actually doing something very, very healthy. Okay, next question is, uh, where are we currently on antibody testing? This has obviously been getting a lot of, of heat and attention in the media just over the last couple of days. Um, do you have any insights on when healthy individuals who experience mild symptoms prior to March may be able to talk to their provider about antibody testing? I don't think that'll happen before two to four weeks. Uh, I think we're ramping up uh, quickly both for testing for infection as well as the antibodies. But I think we're a couple of weeks behind at least. And so I would say, uh, uh, you know, if you call a physician, they'll say, don't call, you know, leave a message. Uh, uh, or once we connect with uh, that approach to your health, uh, I'll send you a text or go to your portal. Uh, they're so busy now just taking care of people still. Uh, I think that's going to start to drift down. I think the ramping by uh, the testing will ramp up, but probably not before at least two weeks. And, and along that same lines, in terms of sort of wellness or preventative care, should people be keeping appointments with their general practitioner? For instance, they have to have a, uh, an annual physical. Should you keep that or is it probably a good idea to maybe postpone that for the next little while? I'd, yeah, I'd postpone that or do a virtual uh, catch up on just general health uh, issues. Uh, I think uh, staying away from uh, uh, medical facilities and especially hospitals right now uh, be a wise thing to do if you can. If there's an emergency, um, some issue has to be resolved, uh, then you do have to get in touch with the appropriate physician or emergency room. Okay, our friend Deborah coming in from the Virgin Islands asks, what happens to persons who are in recovery from COVID-19 that have pneumonia? Are they still contagious? And how long is someone contagious who has had the virus? Or has it's a, yeah, it's really a terrific question, and uh, it's complicated because most of the testing we do tests for genetic material, not for virus and virus growth. So we're assuming that finding genetic material on day five means that's still a virus at day five, and it may well be. Uh, but sometimes the genes can hang out longer than the virus. So if you said, how long are people contagious? Uh, most people have been saying it's probably not uh, contagious uh, much more uh, at the nine days after onset. Uh, others have said, let's be conservative, 14 days after onset of symptoms. And even if you find some genetic material, it may uh, not imply infectivity enough, or it may imply a low enough viral burden that they're not transferable. So conservatively, we would say um, certainly after symptom, probably 14 days, not communicable after that time. Okay, our friend Josh has a question, says, is there a case for intentionally or intentional voluntary exposure to the virus at very low levels with populations who are most likely low risk? He's hearing this advocated by folks who invoke the example of George Washington's intentional inoculation of troops helping win the Battle of Valley Forge. So what about this idea of voluntary exposure at low levels, intentional voluntary exposure? Dr. Wensley, you still there, sir? I think he might have been having some challenges with his video. 
All right, gang, we're going to give him another 30 seconds to come back. Otherwise, we're going to have to cut it short for a technical difficulty. We certainly got through most of the hour, and there it is. We've lost Dr. Wenzel. So grateful to you all. If you have questions, uh, we are happy to take them. I think the easiest way for us to bundle them up would be put your questions into uh, Twitter, ComNet Live, or you saw Dr. Wenzel's uh, contact information. Carrie, if you would, toss that into the chat. So anybody still with us, go ahead and look in the chat. You can send him some questions. He's a rather busy man at the moment, so you can imagine he may not be quick to get back to you, but he's also going to be coming back. Uh, he's agreed we'll have him back in the next two or three weeks to, to hear the latest updates. Um, certainly grateful to him, and sorry we lost him there. But to all of you, thank you very, very much for being with us. Do stay safe. We'll be back uh, actually just on Friday. Chuck Babington, our friend, the former chief political writer for the Associated Press, is going to do a session for us all on writing uh, because no one's reading right now. Let's be honest. We're all just juggling a lot and sifting through a lot of information. So he's going to talk to us about just some principles to make sure that your writing is tight, clear, concise, and effective. Uh, that'll be Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So look for an invite to that. It'll probably be coming into your inbox tomorrow. In the meantime, hope everybody is safe and well, congratulations, Shaheen, on the marriage. Uh, Jade for the brand new beautiful baby girl, and our friend Jesse Salazar, who celebrates a birthday today, and everybody else. Please stay safe and well. Wear your mask. Stay inside as much as you can for the meantime. And obviously, I think all of us are so just incredibly grateful for all the good that you all are doing out into the world and, and the courage and bravery of, uh, of you and the organizations and all the frontline providers uh, in the hospitals and healthcare and, and, of course, around society, whether that's delivering packages or working in the grocery stores. It's just, it's been an extraordinary experience to see what everybody's been able to do. Uh, I, I'll forget, forgive me, I won't make the last count. I was about to spit out of my mouth. But suffice to say, be well, stay safe, and we'll see you again tomorrow and again with Dr. Wenzel in just a couple of weeks' time. Ciao for now, everybody. Cheers.